The Trump administration is touting a tax reform plan this week. How might the proposed changes affect you and your family? Congressman Sean Duffy is here to analyze and much more. And the persecution of Christians abroad is on the rise as Pope Francis begins a visit to Egypt. How should the Pope engage Islam? Georgetown's Father Drew Christensen will weigh in. And we remember the life and legacy of National Review editor and pundit extraordinaire Kate O'Burn with two colleagues who knew her best, Catherine Lopez and Ramesh Ponuru. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Congressman Sean Duffy, Father Drew Christensen, Catherine Lopez, and Ramesh Panuru are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, you send me an email or a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo, or you can find me on email at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. It's been a busy week here in D.C. as President Donald Trump reaches his 100th day in office. To avoid a government shutdown, President Trump agreed to back off of his demand to fund the border wall as part of a spending bill and also to keep some Obamacare subsidies in place. Trump was seeking a $1.4 billion down payment for his cornerstone campaign pledge, which he says can wait until September. Trump won over reluctant Democrats when the White House agreed to pay health care subsidies for low-income earners. The passage of the trillion-dollar spending bill will keep the government operating until September and would be the first bipartisan measure passed during the Trump presidency. Meanwhile, House Republicans had a breakthrough on its repeal and replace efforts concerning Obamacare. The conservative House Freedom Caucus said it would support a revised version of the American Health Care Act that would allow states to opt out of some requirements, among them requirements for insurers to cover essential benefits and the freedom to charge different rates for healthy people as opposed to those with pre-existing conditions. Conservatives embrace the revisions as a way to lower health care expenses. Moderate Republicans are balking saying the changes would reduce benefits. Nevertheless, its passage would give Trump another accomplishment to tout in his first 100 days. More on the president's massive tax reform plan and the renegotiations of the North American Free Trade Agreement in our next segment. And in spite of progress on the legislative front, President Trump's recent executive order on immigration has been blocked by yet another federal judge. The executive order would deny federal dollars to sanctuary cities that protect undocumented immigrants. U.S. District Judge William Oreck issued a temporary injunction in lawsuits brought by the city of San Francisco and Santa Clara County. Last week, the Justice Department warned so-called sanctuary cities that they would lose millions in federal funds if they failed to comply with immigration statutes or declined to cooperate with immigration officials. San Francisco City Attorney Dennis Herrera had this to say. In San Francisco alone, about $2 billion was at stake. Without it, thousands of San Francisco's most vulnerable residents would have lost access to meals and medical care. The president is selling fear. He is trying to paint all immigrants as criminals. And nothing could be further from the truth. Trump noted his objections on Twitter, saying, quote, once again, a single district judge has ignored federal immigration law to set a new immigration policy for the entire country. See you in the Supreme Court. And in Europe, with the major parties out of contention in France's upcoming presidential election, the country's political establishment is rallying around the man who helped shut them out. Centrist upstart Emmanuel Macron has become the beneficiary of an alliance aimed at keeping the conservative Marine Le Pen out of Elysee Palace. Socialist President Francois Hollande has pledged his support as well as German Chancellor Angela Merkel 
a horde of EU politicians and Muslim groups who all appear to be troubled by Le Pen's populist messaging. Le Pen has focused on France's working class economy, has called for immigration reform and an exit from the European Union. The contest is being framed as a major test for the populist wave that led to Brexit and the election of Donald J. Trump last year. Polls have Macron as the front runner in the May 7th runoff, but Le Pen has gained since Monday's primary election. Back here stateside, the erasure of historical markers are underway in New Orleans. Led by the efforts of Democratic Mayor Mitch Landrieu, the first of four prominent Confederate and Jim Crow era monuments were removed Monday. Under the cover of night, city workers dismantled the Liberty Place Monument, a 35-foot granite obelisk that pays tribute to whites who tried to topple a biracial reconstruction government installed in New Orleans after the Civil War. Three other statues will be removed in the days ahead, namely monuments of Confederate President Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and P.G.T. Beauregard, a Confederate general. The monuments are viewed by some as symbols of racism and white supremacy. Ironically, Beauregard, post-Civil War, was a proponent of equal rights in Louisiana and was an outspoken leader of the prominent biracial coalition that called for integrated schools, public accommodations, and voting rights for black men. On Monday, Mayor Landrieu said at a press conference that New Orleanians now have a chance to create new symbols together as one people and to have civil discussions about the totality of our history, end quote. And the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom has singled out 16 nations for the persecution of religious believers in those respective countries. Ten countries already have the State Department designation as a country of particular concern. The Commission would like six more added to that number. The Central African Republic, Nigeria, Pakistan, Russia, Syria, and Vietnam. Countries of particular concern are defined as those with particularly severe violations of religious freedom that are systematic, ongoing, and egregious. Commission Chairman Jesuit Father Thomas Reese said that the Commission believes religious persecution is worsening in both its depth and breadth. The Commission also noted a rise of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in Europe. A member of that Commission will join us later in the show. Meanwhile, Pope Francis continues his advocacy for migrants this week. This time, he rued the plight of those in European refugee camps, calling them concentration camps. While visiting with migrants at Rome's Basilica of St. Bartholomew, Francis recalled his trip to a camp on the Greek island of Lesbos last year, particularly a Christian woman who was killed because of her faith. He said many such camps are concentration camps because of the great number left there inside. He urged governments to get refugees out of holding centers and further chided them, saying that when it comes to migrants, it seems that international accords are more important than human rights. The head of the American Jewish Committee, David Harris, objected to the Pope's use of the term concentration camp. He said the Pope should reconsider his regrettable choice of words, noting that the conditions of such migrant camps in Europe may well be difficult, but concentration camps they certainly are not. And a leading Vatican prelate, Cardinal Robert Sarah, warned that the Church ignores the real crisis in the world today if she focuses on social justice issues rather than her basic mission to evangelize. The prefect for the Congregation for Divine Worship said in a recent interview, the church is gravely mistaken if she thinks that her essential mission is to offer solutions to all the political problems related to justice, peace, poverty, the reception of migrants, etc., while neglecting evangelization. Cardinal Sarah insisted that while the church cannot disassociate herself from the human problems, she will ultimately fail in her mission if she forgets her real purpose. He decried influential church leaders who insist that national churches have the capacity to decide doctrinal and moral matters for themselves. And in Ireland, the Diocese of Limerick had a day without mass. Bishop Brendan Leahy instructed every diocese to host 
a lay-led liturgy instead of mass on Tuesday. Bishop Leahy said that the move comes from an initiative floated at last year's synod, which called for greater involvement from the laity in operations of the church. He declared the fall of vocations as inevitable, and as such, we need to explore new and exciting opportunities to celebrate the word. One of the ways will be through lay-led times of public prayer, the bishop said. And in the Diocese of Orlando, Florida, they are reprimanding a teacher, a school teacher, for allegedly disrespecting Islam. Mary Smythe, a religion and social studies teacher at Blessed Trinity Catholic School in Ocala, passed out copies of an 1853 text by St. John Bosco. It was titled, The Catholic Educated in His Faith. Now, the text by the saint is consistently critical of Islam, describing it as, quote, a monstrous mixture of faiths and Muhammad's teachings as, quote, ridiculous, immoral, and corrupting. Diocesan spokesman Jacqueline Flanagan called the teacher's actions an unfortunate exhibit of disrespect. No comment from St. John Bosco. And Pope Francis offered a surprise message at the annual TED conference in Vancouver, Canada this week. The Pope delivered an 18-minute talk from the Vatican structured around the theme of the conference, The Future You. TED, short for Technology, Entertainment and Design, organizes conferences around the world. Pope Francis took the opportunity to urge the world to show more solidarity with the poor and the weak, saying, quote, I would love it if this meeting could help to remind us that we all need each other. We can only build the future by standing together, including everyone. Tuesday's TED appearance was the first by a pope and apparently was a hit. More than half a million viewed the talk within a day. And the Will Wilder 2 book tour continues. I'll be back home in New Orleans, Louisiana at the Barnes & Noble in Metairie on Tuesday, May 2nd at 7 p.m. And then I'll be headed to the Chicago area on Friday, May 5th. I'll be signing books at Anderson's Bookshop in LaGrange, Illinois at 7 p.m. And Saturday, May 6th, I'll be in Dallas, Texas at the Northwest Highway Barnes & Noble at 3 p.m. All the details are at RaymondArroyo.com. I can hardly wait to see you all. When we return, tax reform, the Obamacare repeal and replace, and will there ever be a border wall? Congressman Sean Duffy is here to update us when the world over continues. Stay right there. Pro-growth tax reform means that we will have lower rates, we will have a simpler tax code with fewer brackets, and we will have an IRS that exists only to serve the taxpayer. Welcome back to the World Over Live. That was Speaker of the House Paul Ryan at a press conference earlier this week. Will Congress be able to pass a tax reform bill? Where does the repeal and replacement of Obamacare stand? And how about President Trump's proposed border wall? Where's that? To discuss it and much more, we're joined by a member of the House Financial Services Committee, Wisconsin Congressman Sean Duffy. Welcome back to the program. Raymond, good to see you. Thanks All for right. having me on. Congressman, let's start with these proposed tax reforms. Uh, a lowering of rates across the board for individuals. He's got three tiers. What will that mean? 35, 25, and 10. It's going to simplify the tax code. Um, he's he's kickstarting the conversation right now okay. um, about how do you actually grow the economy, which is leaving more money in people's pockets. They know how uh, to better spend their money than the federal government. But this gets really complicated really no. quick because Democrats want to raise taxes. Republicans want to lower taxes. So to get bipartisanship on this is going to be tough. So no. we're using this process called budget reconciliation. Mm. Tax reform has to go first. You get a trillion dollars of, of, of tax reform there. You go to taxes, uh, tax reform. And you use that trillion dollars to lower the rates. It gets complicated, but we can actually do it if we get health care reform done. Okay, part of this, at the heart, really, of this tax reform uh, bill is a 15% corporate tax rate, right. which is really low. Right now, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the, in the, in in the, the nation, the world. world. Uh, 
what can you, we expect? Do you think that'll get through? Is that acceptable? Well, so this might be the, the, the starting bid, but uh, we hear anywhere from, from 15 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. And what you'll hear is Democrats say, oh, no, tax breaks for the, the, the wealthy. New York Times today, tax overhaul well, will, will aid wealthiest. All we have to do, Raymond, is look around the world. Um, uh, developing nations have lowered their taxes and kick-started and grown their economy, and it helps the middle class. It helps poor people with more opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, if we do the same thing here, that's how you grow your middle class with more and better paying jobs. Um, so, again, this anemic growth of one5 mm -hmm. to 2% over the eight years of Obama, if we get that to 3%, Man, we're putting people back to work with, with, with better jobs. Do this you think is how you this do will it. pass? I mean, the, the estimates is that this could explode the deficit by $7 trillion over 10 years. $7 trillion. There are some deficit hawks that get indigestion reading this plan. So, You're not concerned about that? So, I'm always, listen, a $20 trillion uh, debt concerns me. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the growth that comes from tax reform, uh, which these numbers don't take into account, mm -hmm. um, I don't think you actually see deficit growth. I think you see us able to grow tax revenue because of a growing economy, and we're actually able to start to pay down the debt mm -hmm. from this new growth and new revenue. And how do you, how do you address, though, the significant drop in revenue? I mean, you, you just think because of the economic activity that this will engender, that that will make up the difference of, oh, of revenue loss? Listen, absolutely. And, we, Raymond, what happens, too, th th this is a problem that everyone agrees on. Powerful interests have come to Washington, and they lobby, and they, they carve out their profits, their mm -hmm. revenue. Um, and if you're not as powerful here in Washington, you're paying the full boat. If you simplify the tax code, you lower rates, but you take away those loopholes and deductions, the tax code is far fairer, so we know what everyone is paying, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what kind of political influence you have in this town. It just means we're treating everybody under the 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 the, the, the same tax structure. Yeah, everybody gets the same. Everybody's yeah. getting the same the same cut uh, in the macro. Uh, let's talk about Planned Parenthood funding for a second. I thought. I know the president signed an order that relaxed the Obama rule, mm -hmm. where the states had to fund Planned Parenthood or suffer all sorts of ramifications. They now can opt out of that. But on a federal level. It's still in the budget, yes? Well, what we're going to do is a, a one-week a, a one week extension probably uh, tomorrow. Yep. Um, and then there's a debate. I mean, Democrats in the Senate can hold us hostage because you need 60 votes over there because right. of their rules. There's only 52 Republicans. So they can say, hey, we're not going to support a wall. We're not going to support defunding Planned Parenthood. Uh, and if you put those things in, they're poison pills, and we're going to shut down the government. However, if we get health care reform done, we are taking away money from Planned Parenthood, which is a great advancement mm -hmm. for the cause of life. I want to move to this Obamacare repeal and replace. The yep. president promised it. I know many of your colleagues ran on that, yeah. repealing and replacing, and... I did myself. And you. <laughs> now, they've come up with an amendment to the GOP overhaul that went down in flames a few weeks ago. This amendment would it's allow... It's not so harsh. That's I know. Well, harsh. I'm just trying to describe right, it okay. in a way that's but. colorful and dramatic that people <laughs> at home will understand. It went down in flames. It was ugly. Uh, and the, the idea now is here's an amendment. It allows states to opt out of certain mandates, uh, mandates in Obamacare. You, you don't have to provide certain services. Uh, you can charge varying rates to people with pre-existing conditions. How is this a repeal and replace, Congressman Duffy? We're rising from the ashes, Raymond. Um, so <laughs> this, is, this is the Phoenix <laughs> Obamacare repeal and replace. Is that what this so is being labeled? Listen, here's here's what we're doing. I mean, this is we're using again budget reconciliation. It's a three-phase process, and it gets it gets complicated. So you can say, well, you aren't repealing and replacing, Congressman. Mm -hmm. I get, we're, we're actually reforming the way healthcare works. Okay. We're empowering people to make decisions uh, for the risks that they face in their life. We're empowering you. Because you know what risks you and your family face. Bureaucrats in Washington, Raymond, don't know what's best for you or your family. Um, and so th th that's that at the heart of, of what we're doing with this reform. Instead of making it government-centric, we're making it individual and family-centric. And, and taking away the mandates that are forced upon uh, people, we're saying, hey, listen, let's let the states make these decisions. What's right for, yeah. what's right for those states? They know their people better. Um, let's, let's allow them to, 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 to make those choices themselves. And again, this is what we always believe, which is state-based decision-making. Are you at all concerned that the president, in trying to negotiate uh, away from a government shutdown, he, he said, okay, I don't need a down payment on my border wall, and I'll pay some of these Obamacare subsidies. Does that concern you? And is this the end of the border wall? 
He's saying he'll wait till September for it. Do you think he'll actually get it come <laughs> September? So I, I think with, with, with Democrats in the Senate and the fact that this resist movement is so strong that you see rise up around the country, it's hard for Democrats to give Donald Trump any kind of a win. Mm -hmm. And this brings me to a different point. Uh, the senators have to get rid of the filibuster rules. We have to go with a simple majority in the Senate. You saw them blow up the filibuster rule for the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Democrats blew it up for the lower federal courts. Right. If, if Republicans, Republicans don't do it now, Democrats will do this the next time they take control of the Senate. Mm -hmm. So let's get rid of these rules and let's move an agenda forward that can, that, that can secure a southern border, that can actually um, get health care reform done in a comprehensive fashion. It allows us to get tax reform done without these crazy rules that don't make any sense to anybody, including us in the House. Yeah. I want to move on to something. This is President Trump talking about NAFTA. Now, he had originally planned to simply back out of NAFTA. And yeah. then he announced this this week. Well, I was going to terminate NAFTA as of two or three days from now. Uh, the president of Mexico, who I have a very, very good relationship, called me. And also the Prime Minister of Canada, who I have a very good relationship, and I like both of these gentlemen very much, they called me. And they said, rather than terminating NAFTA, could you please renegotiate? I will, and I think we'll be successful in the renegotiation, which frankly would be good because it would be simpler. But we have to make a deal that's fair for the United States. What should the president insist on from this NAFTA pact? Equity and fairness. Let me, just, let me give you a quick example. In Wisconsin, Dairy's Big. Yep. Uh, we export a lot of ultra-filtered milk to Canada. Right. Uh, the Canadians use a, a little loophole in NAFTA, and they stopped taking uh, American Wisconsin milk really? because they're subsidizing Canadian milk. Mm. Um, Donald Trump tweeted out a, about this a couple days ago. He mentioned it in Wisconsin uh, when he was there at Snap-on. Um, we need to get tough on those who abuse us um, on trade deals. And Donald Trump is so popular right now with our farmers back in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, he's now going to leverage the imports from Canada into Wisconsin that they use for wood, a 20% tariff. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of strong talk and strong behavior that, that actually catches the attention of the Mexicans and the Canadians to say, we're not going to be run over anymore. We're going to look out for our own people, our own interests, and make sure trade is fair for the American mm -hmm. worker. And it's smart politics for it Donald really Trump. Is. And probably why his base has stuck by him in these polls where they were looking I think, to see if there was erosion. He's got 96% support from the people who voted for him. In Wisconsin, he's up 10 points um, right now from where he was a week before the election. He's doing wow. very well. That's amazing. Uh, let's shift quickly to North Korea. They released a propaganda video this week. It showed a missile striking the Capitol, the White House. Now, whether they actually can accomplish that is a, is a different matter. But they may have ballistics that could reach right. the, the United States. How concerned are you? What should we be doing? I know there was a big meeting with senators, a briefing at the White House this week. So this is incredibly serious. So uh, obviously North Korea has nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, they have ballistic missiles. The question is, do they have intercontinental ballistic missiles that mm -hmm. they could put that nuclear weapon on and reach the United States of America? Our past presidents, Republican and Democrat, have uh, basically stepped away from North Korea. Donald Trump understands the threat, and is engaging. And the key to this is China. Mm -hmm. um, and he's not letting China off the hook. He's uh, ex displaying a show of force. Um, and I think we have to push this. Uh, no one wants war, but we have to push this to a resolution because if we don't, with a, I mean, with a radical leader, um, we could have uh, a nuke dropped in the United States of America. We can't tolerate that. And that's why this tough action and tough talk um, and, and getting China's buy-in is so important. Before I let you go, uh, the 100 days is, uh, is upon us here of the Trump administration. Now, this is one of those kind of, uh, n not to steal a term, but this is one of those fake benchmarks that people in Washington like to talk about that, frankly, don't mean a lot to people at home. I, and, and frankly, I don't think it has much bearing. But the fact is, when you look back at this 100 days, if that's indeed a marker at all, you see a series of executive orders, many of the most important ones dealing with immigration, blocked by the courts. Virtually no major legislation moved through the House. Some people will say nothing happened in 100 days. What is your perspective from Capitol Hill, Congressman? So uh, I'm supportive of the executive orders implemented by the president. He's trying. He's working. Yes, he's being stopped by uh, progressive liberal courts. But uh, we're close to a deal on health care. If we get it done, you know, on, on Friday or Saturday, we'll, we'll get in with that 100-day window. I think we're going to get it done. And if we get health care done, we're going to get taxes done. We're going to get infrastructure done. 
And so, yes, it's not the best results in the first 100 days, mm -hmm. but if you look at the first six to eight months of this presidency, you are going to see, I, I think, some very nice successes. And look what's happening. You're seeing economic growth. You're seeing reinvestment. You're seeing the stock market up. You're seeing optimism across our country flourishing mm -hmm. because people know that they're not going to have the heavy boot of government on their neck. They have someone who understands business is going to, and is going to lift it off right. and let them expand and grow and focus on the business of their business instead of trying to navigate the rules uh, of government. Congressman Sean Duffy, always a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Uh, before I go to a break, I have a very important uh, message I had to, to deliver, and I didn't do this earlier on in headlines. A special thank you to my producer, my senior producer, Christopher Edwards, who has reached the 20-year mark with the network, with EWTN, and he's almost been working for me that long and with me. Uh, a special thanks to Christopher Edwards on his 20th anniversary. I hope we see a few others. When we return, the Pope is off to Egypt as religious persecution surges to new highs. How should the Pope engage with Islam? Father Drew Christensen will tell us when the world over returns. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the world over. Religious freedom is contracting globally, particularly for Christians. Pope Francis is on his way to Egypt just weeks after 44 Coptic Christians were slaughtered there at two churches. How should the Pope engage Islam? And is true dialogue possible between Christians and Muslims? Here with answers is distinguished professor of ethics and global human development at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service, Father Drew Christensen. Father, thank you for being on the show and welcome back. Good to be here. Hey, I want to start with this week. Your name was in some headlines. Um, the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom uh, delineated the countries of concern. We reported some of them earlier. And among the members of that panel is James Zogby. And the famous pollster, he suggested that um, Israel be attached to that list of countries of concern for religious freedom. You joined him in, in uh, supporting that statement. Why? Well, I was there as kind of a witness. I had been present when the Latin Patriarch, the Roman Catholic Patriarch of Jerusalem, then Fuad Twal, had met with the commission two years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And he'd indicate some of his concerns. and received a, uh, a very poor reception on the part of the commission. Mm. Uh, they, they would not hear that Israel was guilty of any violations of, or infractions of religious freedom. Oh. And uh, uh, it took them months to get a, a very uh, vapid kind of response to him about his, about his requests. Mm. Um, and so I was there to say this had happened. It had happened before uh, when other... Uh, Catholic members had, had urged that the situation of Christians in the Holy Land be looked at as well as right. Muslims, but, but particularly Palestinian Christians. And a report was written, was approved, and then at that time was withdrawn the next day without, when, the, when the, the, the Catholic yeah. member was not present in town to be part of the conversation. Mm. So uh, what I was doing by being there was to confirm that uh, uh, Mr. Zogby's complaint that the commission's operation had kind of singled out Israel as a, as a country that you couldn't criticize. Mm. So he pointed out a number of countries that... And do you think there was a sensitivity that the, the commission would be viewed as anti-Semitic or well, it might have... I think so, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think also uh, there was a real desire to, to, to not put Israel in any bad light mm -hmm. on the part of, of several. But others, they were just afraid that the commission would be tarred and I think be comp their work would be a compromise by being caught up in controversy. Over. Yeah, because uh, in other parts of the report, they talk about the rise of anti-Semitism in some places. That's so right. that may have helped, That's right. uh, yeah. you know, uh, want, want to, to remove Israel from any right. uh, consideration or investigation, which if you're on that list, there are investigations that That's take right. place That's by right. law. Yeah. So that, that was, I'm sure, the other part of it. Let's talk for a moment about Egypt. Uh, Pope Francis going into this very difficult situation in Egypt. Uh, you have President al-Sisi, who, if you talk to the Coptic Christians, they're very pleased with him. They feel he's protected them and come out strong against the Muslim Brotherhood. At the same time, he has a rather checkered 
human rights record. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but he did call, I think it was 2015, he called for a reform in the theology of Islam. And now you have the grand imam at Al-Azhar, the great university and, and mosque in Egypt, agreeing with that and trying to begin this process. He's invited Pope Francis and now Bartholomew, the, the uh, patriarch of Constantinople, to join him during the pope's visit. What should the pope say there? And what should he and Bartholomew's posture be? Well, I think he should welcome the fact that they, they are developing a political theology suited to the modern world. Um, th they've issued a declaration just recently that focuses on citizenship as the basis of treatment and not membership in a religious group of any sort, mm. which is a real departure. Yeah. And also lays down the Constitution as kind of the basis of laws. Now, that's a problematic question, I think, in, in Egypt. But for the moment, right. at least, there's progress in saying that citizenship should be the basis of the treatment uh, of particular religious minorities by governments, not their belonging to minority. Mm -hmm. And that's the Holy See's policy in the Middle East since the agreement with Israel in 1993. Right. Rather than uh, looking for protection for the church directly, it said, we want, we want the religious liberty of our members. For all people. For all people, exactly. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, that's where the Egyptians are going. So there is a kind of common basis in, if you will, 20th, 21st century political theology, which to dialogue about how, how these issues can be addressed. Mm -hmm. Now, Sisi's a very difficult problem, but he's been very, very good to the Christians, uh, a much better protector than either Hosni Babark was kind of hands off. Right. And uh, Morsi said it, he'd do a lot, and he did nothing. In fact, he'd, he sent very hardline Muslim governors to states where there right. was tension. So uh, the fact that Sisi's provided protection in various ways uh, and is, an improvement. A, is a very big improvement. Yeah. Uh, now, Father Samir, who is a, a, an expert on, on relations in the Middle East, he has said the Pope should urge Muslim leaders to reinterpret the Koran in a way that fosters peace for the future. Would you agree with that? I, I don't think it's, it's the, uh, the place of any religious leader to urge another religious leader to reform their... There. Mm. But what he should do is to, to urge him to embrace peace as a common cause with other religious leaders of the world. And with the other religious leaders there, it's quite possible that, that, that he can come up with a formula in the midst of that. And I, I would think that the purpose of calling such a meeting in this environment is precisely to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, because you, you have the Coptic patriarch, the, the Orthodox patriarch, the patriarch the of the Pope. West, the Pope, yeah. all there. And there'll be others, Jim Winkle, the president, the uh, General Secretary of the National Council of Churches will be there, so it'll be an international religious gathering. And I think that's the proper context is to say, let's 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 honor the common common points we have about mm -hmm. about standing up for religion and peace together. There have been a lot of conversations over the last few weeks about how the Pope should position himself as he engages not only Egypt but Islam, and yeah. that's what this moment is really about right, in right, part. Right. Now, viewers will remember when Pope, Fran Pope, Pope Benedict rather, issued that Regensburg Address. Right. And uh, I'll read, just to remind people, he started by, by quoting a Byzantine emperor who was questioning the relationship between religion and violence. And he said, show me just, quoting that emperor, by the way, show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhuman such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. Then Pope Benedict goes on to uh, comment on the emperor's words, and he said, and why he feels this way. And Benedict said, God is not pleased by blood and not acting reasonably is contrary to God's nature. Faith is born of the soul, not the body. Whoever would lead someone to faith needs the ability to speak well and to reason properly without violence and threats. Should that be the posture that Francis adopts when he engages Islam? Should he point out that there are verses in, in the Quran that encourage violence and we have to find a way to reinterpret these or, or look at them anew as we move forward together in brotherhood? Yeah, what I recall is, is Pope Benedict going from there a month later to Turkey. Right. And very courageously going when a priest has been killed. Uh, yep. 
the, they've been burning of churches and so on, mm -hmm. and and making his trip to Turkey and uh, having and the Hagia Sophia, yeah, Hagia mm -hmm. Sophia, and as also the Blue Mosque, and having a a, 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 a moment of of uh, prayerful reflection, uh, facing facing Mecca with the head of the of the, of the mosque, and and uh, basically uh, kind of saying we have a. Um, a common God that we worship, mm -hmm. and uh, let's do it side by side. And he did it. Uh, so I, I find, I find, in terms of his overall papacy, hard to figure out where he's where this the Regensburg quote. And it's really just the opening part of the, the right, speech. It's of not the address. The, right. the address. It's not the whole the whole of it. And I thought I saw it. I, I remember we were commenting on it live. We were watching it live. I was uh, covering it, and I, I always saw it as almost a shock treatment. It was to get everybody's attention and then move them along. And you'll remember, there was a concrete action from that rather provocative speech in that Islam, for the first time, sent leaders to the Vatican and they had this dialogue and this real conversation. Right. right. The, 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 so there, to my eye, there were real fruits that came from it. Oh, yes, including, including the, the Muslim uh, uh, letter, uh, a common word among us, mm -hmm. which is about mm -hmm. the love of God and neighbor as kind of being central to, to both faiths, mm -hmm. um, which uh, remarkably brought together all sorts of sects of Islam that had never been brought together before. Yep. And Francis has, has the power, I think, to, to bring together people of different backgrounds yep. because he's so human. Yep. And it's not Islam he's addressing, he's addressing Muslims. Yep. And I think that's, with Francis, that's the key. He realizes he has a believing person right here with him. Is that why you see the reluctance and, and some have criticized him? In fact, he was asked on a, uh, on a trip, why don't you condemn Islamic violence? And he said, I'll quote him, uh, if I talk about Islamic violence, should I speak about Catholic violence too? Not all Muslims are violent. There is a small group of extremists in practically every religion. We have them too. Is that, has he made a mistake by not differentiating? I mean, the fact is, you, you know, the League of Mary isn't blowing up mosques. But, uh, you know, uh, is right. there a problem uh, being that inclusive, if you will? Well, I, I, th I think it's, it's, it's not so a matter of being inclusive as, as saying, look, there, there are millions upon millions of Muslims mm -hmm. who want to live peacefully. I mean, uh, and mis live peacefully with Christians. I remember visiting in, in Lebanon and going to the shrine of Our Lady in Lebanon and being just astounded as I came down, there's a stream of Muslim women coming up mm. and that, that they, work, they pray there regularly for healing. And I discovered later that many Marian shrines mm -hmm. uh, in, in, the, in South Asia and in, in the Middle East are attended by Muslim, Muslims as well as Christians. Mm. Uh, and I, I think that, that uh, uh, that's where Francis has his strength in being able to dress people as people as believers. Very good. Father Drew Christensen, thank you so much for being here. We will be in touch in the days ahead. Good. Thank you. When we return, one of the most beloved women in Washington, D.C. left us this week. We'll remember the late, great Cato Byrne when we return with Catherine Jean Lopez and Ramesh Ponuru when the world over continues. Stay right there. Note I'm wearing uh, Hillary Clinton press conference pink tonight. Let's see if it makes me a little more trustworthy. They wanted TV cameras. They got TV cameras, so I suppose the hearings were successful. They, I have not seen such perfect attendance at a congressional hearing no, right. ever. Yeah. And they didn't even take a seventh inning stretch. There I go, Margaret. Yeah. For fear of missing <laughs> camera time. How do you ignore North Korea? Well, I'm going to ignore that question. Another, <laughs> at another time, right. I'll, I'll set right. Mark right on North Korea. Welcome back to The World Over. That was the irrepressible Kate O'Byrne, who we lost on Divine Mercy Sunday to cancer. She was a beloved figure here in Washington, D.C., a town with almost no beloved figures, I might add. Kate was a feisty godmother to conservatives, and after serving stints at the Heritage Foundation and as Washington editor of National Review, she became a household name as a member of CNN's Capital Gang. Her warmth, wit, and kindness will be sorely missed in a city that often lacks those qualities. Tonight I'm joined by two of her colleagues, protégés, and dear friends. Please welcome National Review Editor-at-Large Catherine Lopez and Senior Editor at National Review Ramesh Panaru. Thank you for both being here. And um, 
I, I wish it were under happier circumstances. Yeah. But Thank dear you for doing it. Kate deserves to be celebrated a little Absolutely. bit. And uh, I want to I want to start with her background and then how you all came to know her. Uh, Kate O'Byrne was really a public policy maven at heart. She really understood policy, and not only that, she knew how to communicate it. Here she is with Bill Buckley back in 1990 on Firing Line. Watch. Oughtn't we to change the emphasis from the one to the other? That is, say, oughtn't we to say, help everybody who's upwardly mobile to the extent that you can, even if you acknowledge that there are going to be some people who are left behind? Or are you, is neither one of you willing to make that concession? I, I am uncomfortable with the underlining argument that says, how does choice respond to the needs of disadvantaged students? Um, we can't dismantle public schools and allow other parents to have choice. We have to, in a sense, hold all children hostage in a failing public school system rather than let some escape. Mm, yeah. And I'm very uncomfortable with that notion. And it's never been the way, frankly, and, you know, the generations of Americans have advanced. Uh, the reason I wanted to show that was really this would set the course for her the rest of her life in some ways because of the Buckley relationship and then taking the reins as Washington editor of National Review, where you all came to know her. What was she like as an editor? Catherine Lopez. Well, I actually met her around the same time I think I met you. Um, mm -hmm. I was a freshman at Catholic University in Washington, wow. and I was interning there my second semester freshman year, and she was a vice president at oh. Heritage, and that's where I first met her. And I rem remember being amazed how kind she was to, you know, this little scared freshman, and and um, and then I wound up working with her at, at, at National Review. And, and she, I, what, what is striking and what has been striking is people share their stories over the la last couple of days it's very much like Bill Buckley. She was the same on camera as she was mm -hmm. behind the scenes. She was kind and attentive and wise and brilliant. And, um, and you always just wanted to be around her. And yeah. you absorbed so much and enjoyed so much. Ramesh, she had a real talent for mentoring young people, which is something you certainly don't see here in D.C. I mean, everybody's on their own track. They don't have time for anybody, even their own children. But Kate made time for everybody. What impact did she have on you? And how did you meet her? Well, she had an enormous impact on me, as on, as on many other people. Um, I came to work for National Review's Washington office in the summer of 1995 at the same time she did. She was already in National Review's orbit. Right. She was a trusted advisor, but she actually left the Heritage Foundation for NR around that time. And then she was between National Review and the National Review Institute. I shared an office with her for 17 years. Oh my gosh, the, and, the secondhand smoke alone has yeah, been awful. That's, right. that's right, but <laughs> but I enjoyed all of it. We never had in all that time a crossword between us, which is pretty amazing if you know me at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, she, you know, you were talking about her as a godmother of conservatives. She's literally my godmother. Yes, she was. She was there at my baptism. Yeah, and I want to talk about that later. We're going to talk about the the Catholicism of Cato Byrne, which I think really is the spine of everything that that the goodness that she she brought to the world and even the way she interacted with political opponents i think you could sum up with her faith it really did inhabit every part of her life and this is kate o'burn at her best she had this no nonsense approach to punditry she was always very reasonable even her political opponents couldn't disagree with her this is from a capital gang reunion in 2008 on meet the press when she was asked about Hillary Clinton's presidential ambitions. You can't criticize Hillary Clinton without being afraid of strong women. If uh, the men on the stage go after the front runner, for God's sakes, it's an attack by the patriarchy. Uh, it does her no favors, and Hillary Clinton is not going to be elected to anything if her campaign is seen as a vindication, somehow, of uh, this kind of old-fashioned grievance feminism. You know, with the exception of Laura Ingram and Rachel Maddow, there are no whip-smart women like this in media today anywhere that not only deeply uh, understand the policy, but can come papers. up with these withering one-liners just when you need them to sort of capture it. What, what made her so attractive and so riveting on television in this role? Well, a couple of things. First of all, she knew what she was talking about, so there was substance there. You know, in, in the tradition of firing line, right? right? You had a real conversation. Um, and, and as you mentioned before, you know, some of the most moving tributes come from people like Margaret Carlson, yeah. who they didn't agree on anything, fellow panelists on, right. on, on Capital Gang. Um, but, but Kate 
sort of adopted Margaret as a sister. I remember being in the office. Kate would talk so affectionately about Margaret mm -hmm. because she loved people and she yeah. saw saw them as made in the image and likeness of God, like we're supposed yeah. to, you yeah. know. And so, so it, it made it so much easier to have a conversation with someone you disagreed with because at the end of the day, you know, at the end mm -hmm. of the show, you 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 could be people together, you yeah. know. Go you know, ahead, Ramesh. People watched her thought that she was just an enormously talented communicator, which she was, but there was a lot of off-camera work. She did a lot of homework, she did a lot of practicing her lines. In that respect, actually, and this just occurred to me, there's a similarity to Ronald Reagan, who was also treated as a great communicator, and of course he had the natural talent, but he worked and worked and worked. Yeah, no, it wasn't secondhand. She did, I mean, she, she didn't just wing it. She really studied Never. and worked and, and was ready for every occasion. She was almost like the Auntie Mame of Washington. I mean, she, she, Kate was always, first of all, she was literally larger than life. She was the tallest person in every room, and usually the smartest. I mean, she just lit up a room when she was there. And just full of grace and charm. And, and I was, as Ramesh was talking, just the other day I found a pile of papers and notebooks. She would take so many notes and have so much research oh. for, for a 10 minute clip on, on CNN or whatever. Yeah. She, uh, she really did want to make sure that she was d delivering the best information as mm -hmm. well as, as an, an, a whip smart analysis and, oh, and gosh, anyway, a hard worker. And had a response to anything that the liberals would say. Absolutely. She had prepared in advance. And occasionally conservatives, too. I yes. remember yes. Her saying, now, let me tell you something, Bob, and just shutting right. Bob Novak down, who right. I worked for at the time, on those capital gang panels. She was unafraid to kind of take all comers. And she did it with a, there was a grace about it. Oh, yeah. She was not nasty. Right. And today, television is so nasty. And as you said earlier, you've got a lot of people with half-formed opinions or things right. they picked up in the green room. Cato Byrne never, never operated like that. Snark is our era's substitute for wit, and it's the latter that she had. Right. You are right. And, and wisdom. And I want to show you this, because this, I think, of all the clips, maybe captures her the most. This is Kate's final television appearance, at least we think it is, on our show in 2014. In fact, it was Divine Mercy Sunday of 2014 three years before she would leave us, when she joined us for the canonization of John Paul II in Rome. Watch this. Kate O'Byrne, you met the Pope, John Paul II, in 1993. Tell me about that and uh, the lasting influence and impact he left on you, your family. We were in Rome, my husband Jim worked for the Bishops' Conference right. in the office to aid the church in Eastern Europe and the old Soviet Union. Uh, American Catholics rose to the challenge, you know, mm -hmm. after the fall of the uh, mm -hmm. wall when they needed so much. And so we were privileged, the boys were with us, to go to his private mass in his residence. Mm -hmm. The chapel fitted maybe only 20 people, and he'd come out afterwards every morning and visit with whoever was there. Mm -hmm. So people said to me afterwards, I know he leaned over and kissed our John, mm -hmm. chatted with our Philip. Um, afterwards, people said, what did you say to him? I said, nothing. I was struck completely dumb which I think is one of his miracles, actually. It's probably, it's probably his third miracle. I couldn't say a word. <laughs> now, that is the Kate O'Byrne we knew and loved. She would spend a lot of time in those latter years in Rome, the, you know, really from the time she retired from NRO, she retired from Bloomberg. You, as you mentioned earlier, Ramesh, she was your godmother, also the godmother of uh, Judge Bork, Bob Novak, not exactly easy customers, let's face it. <laughs> Uh, what was it about her? Because she was instrumental in drawing you to the faith. Well, just her example. She was somebody who really lived her faith. It imbued every aspect of her life. Mm -hmm. She took it seriously. She was theologically and culturally Catholic. Yeah. And it was just such an attractive picture yeah. of what Catholicism should be. Yeah, I agree. And and the thing, the thing that I'm going to cry if I talk about it, but the thing that I loved about Kate, she was such fun. Oh my goodness. Kate O'Byrne was the, the most fun. You loved to be around her because she, was, she, she had one-liners galore, and none of them were pre-fab. Pre they were all on the spot. And it was not only funny, it was penetrating. She understood something about humanity and people, and that, that imbued everything she did. Tell us about the last years. She retires. She really dedicates herself to her actually. family and her friends <laughs> and, and annual visits to Rome. She became a professional <laughs> pilgrim in some ways. And she really was a pilgrim. And I remember not just Rome. We, we have these National Review cruises. And oh, yeah. we spent the most beautiful day in Ephesus at Mary's house and, and where John died. And, yeah. and, and she was always so prayerful and beautiful. And actually, that particular day, she set it up so some of us would have that beautiful day who mm -hmm. didn't have the money and the logistics to coordinate it all. Um, and she would give those kind of 
gifts all the time. Um, and she also had a knack for, for making sure she found the person who looked loneliest, saddest, quietest in the room and make sure they were part of a conversation or a lunch, you know, a lunch conversation. She, she didn't miss anything. Yeah. Um, and, and, and she was also full of practical wisdom oh, and she, advice. She, that is so true. Including I mean, making sure I had the right outfit when I met Pope Benedict. <laughs> you know what I mean? she, down to the shoes, by the way. Oh, which, yeah. Rebecca. No, down to the bag. Right, right. Well, my wife used to always comment, you know, we, we'd go to dinner at, at their house or we'd meet Kate at, and, and her husband Jim at a cocktail party. And she'd say, because men never look down. We never look down to the shoes. Never. Rebecca said, did you see Kate's shoes? They matched her outfit. They had to be made together. I'm like, why are you looking at her shoes? But it was true. Kate was always done from top to bottom. I mean, she really was. And would help her friends do the same. Right. No. And school advice, career advice. She was Everything. a great editor. She edited, people don't know this, she edited the first Mother Angelica biography and the last mm. Mother Angelica biography. And how many column ideas did we get from her? <laughs> Too many to count. Yeah. Absolutely. It's going to be one of the hard things for me is going to be not knowing anymore what Kate thinks yeah. about every issue that comes up, every political figure who rises. Mm. Uh, I used to just be able to call her up or stroll into her office and, and ask, what do we think about this? Yeah, yeah. God bless her. Your lasting memory of Kate in our final minute. Um, I remember being in the office depressed that I was uh, about what people were writing about me and about being stressed about deadlines and things like that. Just get over yourself, Catherine. Stop being so self-obsessed, you know? <laughs> and she really knew how to get people back on the straight and narrow, mm -hmm. narrow and, and remember what's most important in life. Yeah, which became, at the end of her life, she really Her family and her faith. Her grandchildren, her sons, who she always referred to as John O'Byrne and Philip O'Byrne. Always their full names. I could never yeah. understand Oh, that. Jim O'Byrne, too, is on the Jim phone. Jim O'Byrne, we, yeah. yeah we Hold on, that. Jim O'Byrne's on the phone. It's your husband. Why are you <laughs> giving it? But it was, you know, I, I now look back on that and I think, because she saw the totality of that person and yes. was sort of recognizing their inherent dignity as their own people, yep. not only her children, her husband, but as their own people. Ramesh, your lasting memory of Kate. You know, uh, my wife was talking to her at one point because my wife was also a really good friend yeah, of your wife's Kate. April. And, uh, and April said something about how she loved me very sweetly. And Kate said, I know, April, but I loved him first. <laughs> <laughs> she was a great lady. What an incredible friend. I, for me, she always, there was this line, you know this, she would say it all the time. When she had a little bit of information to impart to you that she knew you either weren't getting or didn't know, she would say, as you know, Raymond, right. and then <laughs> she'd fill you in. Yes. And it was sort of her way of sparing you right. what, uh, what ignorance you had and how profound <laughs> it was. She kind of, again, setting you on the And make you, you feel path. smarter. And make you feel great. You're right, Kate. I did. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I did know. What a great lady. I, I will absolutely. miss those dinners in Rome and the Prosecco that I think she and I were the only ones who would drink the Prosecco. But uh, what an incredible person. May Thanks dear Kate God. O'Byrne rest in peace. Thank you both for being Thank here. You. And uh, and we, we will, you know, we'll certainly <clears throat> keep her memory alive. And I know you two are doing that already. And she loved you both dearly. Um, if you'd like to read both Catherine Lopez's and Ramesh Ponaru's columns, you can go to nationalreview.com. Well, that is all the time we have until next week. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com, as are the details of my New Orleans and Chicago book signings. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C.